A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Orwell's a difficult one because like you get you get people who who think that like Orwell means like his entire works and it tends to just be like like 1984 that people mean when they when they say Orwellian mm -hmm. mm. yes it's uh usually they encompass the whole concept of 1984 um and I like to I like to bring up a video game actually really quick Half-Life 2 is the perfect demonstration of Orwellian um but after thinking about it, I'm actually going to go a, a separate route. Uh, Huxley is a little bit more of where we are right now. Okay. Um, but if I were to decide, Bradbury seems to have been a predictor of many things. Um, for instance, ATMs. We don't think about this, but ATMs back in the 80s, 24-hour uh, access to your money. That was Fahrenheit 451. Um, that and also the concept of a virtual reality room uh, was done in the 90s. It wasn't perfected till later, but we're already at that level. And that's kind of scary. You know what I mean? I thought the virtual reality room would happen in the 2000s, but it started in the 90s. Um, so I've always found that kind of interesting about uh, about Ray Bradbury. He had pretty sound uh, predictions. We're not at the concept of Orwellian nature yet. And uh, we're getting there, though. We're, we're very close. And uh, that's a danger. You know what I mean? Um, the reason that I went the direction of Huxley at the very beginning, though, uh, was simply because Aldous Huxley was talking about drugs being a, a major part of, uh, of Brave New World. We're inundated with drugs. And I think that was the more sound prediction um, because the people that don't take part, you know, like in, in marijuana or, or alcohol, um, you think you can't get through a day without drinking uh, like a coffee right now, you know? Oh, yeah. The mentality has infected us, you know? Um, so we don't think about it. We don't think about the caffeine or the nicotine. 
Um, so it's kind of a blend in, uh, it's a dangerous speedball. If we're using drugs as a metaphor, it's a very dangerous speedball. Mm. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry I mean, if that, that was a little long winded, but no, man, don't worry. This is what podcasts are for. Yeah. So we, we, we kind of rolled straight into that, didn't we? Um, <laughs> But James, you you are the, the the author of the Concerned Citizens Manifesto. Uh, yes, sir. It's available on Amazon if anyone wants to 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 download it. And so, where where did you first like decide to to write that? Like, we'll come back to to Orwell, Bradbury, Huxley, I'm sure. But like, where where did you first like when when was the moment where you thought, okay, I think I actually have to write this down? Like the thought, like the just because people uh, like I know like haven't spoken to to like a, a reasonable amount of authors on the book. And having written two books myself, well, one and a half, <laughs> the second one's on the mm-hmm. way. But like, you, you, there's like a moment where things go from being just an idea or something you're just sort of like bouncing around your head to the point where you go, okay, I need to write this down. I need to like put this in 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 some sort of like extended written format in order for it to make sense to other people. Like, where where was that like moment for you? Um. <laughs> It's kind of a weird, uh, weird part, right? I think when you write a book, you're not usually in the most comfortable environment. Some people are. Sometimes you can sit down at the computer and you can put out your thoughts. For me, it's totally opposite. It's like my life has to be a spiral to start writing uh, because that's where the creative juices get. Um, You know, that's where they start going. If I record music, it's the same way. I got to be stressed. And one morning, I remember distinctly back in August 2019, I'm like, I, I, I got into a car accident and I didn't know what to do. So I decided with a little bit of my boredom waiting for my jobs, I'm going to start working on a book. And I was thinking very hard about what I was going to write. And during that time period, uh, I had been watching YouTube, I mean, for the last year. I've been watching videos about people who were targeted. They were claiming they were targeted. And I was like, is there something sound to what they're arguing? Because I feel the same way. And I'm, I was starting to wonder if this targeting technology actually came from something else. So as I started researching, it just started as an essay, right? It starts as an essay, but then suddenly you're like, wait, I have a little bit more here. And it became a full book. Um, there were a few more chapters that I was going to involve, but it was too, uh, it, it went down the rabbit hole a little too far. So I wanted to keep it down to earth. So in other words, uh, I wanted to remove the bias and I wanted to show people the evidence of, uh, kind of how much we were getting into things. Um, so as I went through the book process, I was writing it and I was in a storm. I, I probably had arguably as much coffee as Voltaire when I wrote this book. So like, <laughs> like 80 cups of coffee went into the investment. It's almost a cup of coffee per page. And uh, I just sat at the mall and I just kept writing and I studied each chapter that I was going to write. And uh, I wanted to go through how people would come to their, their conclusion in the most sound way possible. So I just broke the chapters down and started with the basics, the history of uh, just wiretapping in general. How far back does that go? Um, and also, uh, the audio and the video, uh, those chapters are pretty important as well because where video starts, um, if you, I'm sure you've read the book, but you kind of find out that, uh, it was the Nazis and the Soviets who were really playing with CCTV. And then that started infecting like the world, like, okay, now we, we like the concept of closed circuit television. It's, it's certainly stopped criminals, but at what point does it stop? You know what I mean? Um, and I think especially in uh, the UK, uh, surveillance is becoming a serious concern. And uh, part of my concern was also my European friends. So as I wrote this book, it was really like dedicated to those who were serious about what was going on with how much video surveillance is a part of our lives. Um, and that's kind of the motivation that helped me finish it was, you know, a lot of things were riding on this book. I, I know I have YouTubers who were watching my videos and there was a lot of pressure. So I wanted to make something to prove, you know, um, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess anytime, anytime you get like anywhere near anything that seems just like mildly out of the ordinary, it becomes like, like there's this part of people's brain 
that just goes, no, 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 that's too crazy. And, yep. and, and, and like I, I had um, James uh, on my show there about oh, my, a month ago. Um, and he's the one that, that put us in touch. And when I was, I was talking to him about his story, like it was, it was crucial for, for me to continue to like check what we could verify. And every time he said something, you go and look and he's right. And, and when you just listen to it, you think, oh, that guy's fucking insane. But as soon as you look <laughs> at all the stuff that he's saying, and it's true, and it's true, and it's true, and you go, wow, okay. But like, I just, what do you think it is in, in people's brain that stops stops them? Like, like, as soon as anything just gets like a little bit crazy, or a little bit sci-fi, or a little bit sort of, well, Orwellian, or Huxley-esque, or whichever word you want to use from, the, from those three. Like, what, what is it that stops people from going beyond that point? Um, it's, you know, to use a term that John Hine had created, jumping the shark, you might be familiar with this term when in a TV show, like Happy Days, you jump the shark, Fonzie jumped the shark. That was too unrealistic. <laughs> That's the uncanny valley effect. Uh, Clyde Lewis on Ground Zero has talked about this. Um, you know, the folks over on Coast to Coast had talked about this. But when things hit an uncanny valley level, they say, that can't be possible. That's weird. That's bizarre. Or we're looking at the technology of deep fakes. And at first, they seemed interesting. But now you're starting to see a lot of deep fakes. It's not just one or two. It's like one every day now. Mm. Or there's a few dozen every day. Mm. And now this is where things are becoming troubling because where does AI start? Where does it stop? And where is the human interaction between the two? So when people hit that point, their minds can't interpret it. So the information goes from being uh, something that's presentable or even uh, non-fictional to it's too fictitious to believe, which means that, you know, technology that we don't know about, like you and I, there's stuff that we just don't know about. Um, the idea of 6G, well, it seems fictional, but it's got to exist, right? This is the problem. There's an uncanny valley and, and where you don't want to go, you don't want to go there if you don't have the evidence. So it stops people from uh, belief, but it creates the questioning. So I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on this topic about conspiracy theories later, but this is where it's important to have the theory and not just let it go to the ground. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess like even, even when you provide people with evidence, they're like, no, nope, no, this is insane. Don't be stupid. Governments wouldn't do something like that. Like I had this experience with, um, like a, a family friend who uh, was in the military and did work with the police and still does some sort of consulting on security stuff. And he, yep. I, I brought up to him the idea of MK Ultra, which is a totally real documented thing. Yep. It happened yep. like the American government and, and I'm not sure if the Canadian government were involved actually, but the, uh, yes. uh, yeah, they were. Okay. So that they, they just took American and Canadian citizens off the street or from mental hospitals or, or, just sort of lifted them off the street and 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 performed horrendous electro electroshock therapy experiments on them or like dosed them up with lsd or that there was loads of, there was loads of like like weird fucked up experiments going on basically and i told i was talking to him about this and he, he just didn't even believe me that that was real and i was like man like the, google it like <laughs> Like it's even when there's evidence, people like struggle struggle to get to that point where where they'll believe what you're saying, and even even with the evidence, and like like it's it, the, did you find you got that a lot when you when you're talking to people about about the the themes and topics in your book? Um, you know, the, I've hit a twilight zone level with my book. So it's almost a question of where do I start? <laughs> uh, you tell your family that you wrote a book and it's like they don't believe you. <laughs> this is weird to me. Okay. So, and I told them you can get my book on Amazon. Feel free to say uh, it's garbage if you'd like, or it's great. I don't, I want you to buy the book and read it and see for yourself. What is your analysis, uh, your analysis and your conclusion? My I have a pretty big family. It's like nobody in my family either knows how to read or didn't buy my book. And I guarantee you all of them know how to read. Uh, so 
it started becoming weird the longer that the book had been published that people weren't acknowledging what was being said in the book. They weren't even arguing against it. They weren't, you know, and I'm, I'm emphasizing, please read this book because what I had labeled and what I had researched, and I have been researching this for a good decade plus. So before I kind of like went off the handle, um, I recognize that this had to have happened. This has happened. It's been documented. It's been recorded. And especially with the Frank Church hearings, there was not a denial by the CIA or the FBI um, and even the Canadian government. Uh, they took part of the Montreal projects. That was the connection to MK Ultra. Um, so here in the Western world, we like to deny it because we don't want to think about that. Uh, and that's what's troubling when you try to present the information in the most cohesive way to show that, yes, I'm sane. I'm trying to label this for you to, to understand. It's like people still can't pick it up, which makes you wonder if the technology is affecting them as well or, or something, you know, whether it's their television or their media, maybe it's not being presented correctly. I, I have no idea. Um, but it's, it, it, again, it's Twilight Zone level where, you know, your own family would overlook something that might be a massive milestone in your life and think it's for nothing, you know, um, but it's very important to understand. And military people that I've tried to show this book to almost ignore me entirely as if like, yes, we know, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of like they've been caught red handed uh, and weren't expecting this kind of this, this style of book, it, it is quite the curveball from your average citizen. Mm. So uh, that's kind of where the, the, the rest of the title comes from, a Concerned Citizens Manifesto, because it is, mm. you know. Um, but I think the word manifesto scares people and they think communism, I, <laughs> even though the bo or book doesn't really have to do with that. But Communism it's or fine. Unabomber, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you, you know, to, not to go off on the tangent, but, you know, when you research somebody like the, uh, the Unabomber, uh, that's an intelligent man that went over the edge and took his knowledge to an extreme. So intelligent people, when you aren't listening to them or they're, you know, they start to just go insane. They really do. They start going violent. Uh, even the, you you know, maybe we should research if the Unabomber was involved secretly in a military project mm. to have him go off the head, you know? Yeah, there's there's a lot of talk about, uh, there, there's some, like, there's some things that people said that he was involved in MK Ultra, and that's what made him lose his mind. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that there was any actual evidence that that took place. Um, the 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 thing that that people think uh, like sort of sent him over the edge uh, was he took part in in like an experiment in while he was at university. I cannot remember what university he went to, but um, he, he took part in some like psychological experiment. As far as I, I was yeah. aware, where he he basically went in and presented his stuff, and then like they they just abused him. They were like, "You're stupid. How could you think this?" Like, and they just sort of abused him for a while to see how he would take it. And people point at that for like breaking him, but. I mean, like just criticizing someone is is not really enough to say like, oh yeah, you know, totally. That's that's what made him want to murder people, uh, that yeah. you know, or send bombs in the mail. That's I, I don't really buy that as a, like a, a good enough explanation. Um, and just also yeah. to note, um, for people who don't know uh, Frank Church, I got up his warning about the NSA. This was from 1975, and he said that. That capability at any time could be turned around on the American people and no American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything. Telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. And that was in 1975. And then, um, as we, we probably all know, uh, Edward Snowden proved that that was 110% totally the case. And uh, then he was exiled <laughs> to Russia. Well, Senator, let me follow up by asking, do you think that the CIA and military intelligence agencies and the FBI have used the emergency provisions, both in law and by emergency agency, the uh, Federal Preparedness Agency it's called now, to, to have contingency plans which threaten the liberty of American citizens. Mr. Rowan, in due course, the committee will pass judgment on those questions. I'm not going to pre-guess the committee or prematurely attempt to pass judgment on this program. But let me tell you this. In the need to develop 
a capacity to know what potential enemies are doing. The United States government has perfected a technological capability that enables us to monitor the messages that go through the air. Uh, these messages uh, are between ships at sea. They could be between units, uh, military units in the field. We have a very extensive capability of intercepting messages wherever they may be in the airwaves. Now that is necessary and important to the United States as we look abroad at enemies or potential enemies. We must know. At the same time, that capability at any time could be turned around on the American people. And no American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. If this government ever became a tyranny, if a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny. And there would be no way to fight back because the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how privately it was done, is within the reach of the government to know. Such is the capability of this technology. Now, why is this investigation important? I'll tell you why. Because I don't want to see this country ever go across the bridge. I know the capacity that is there to make tyranny total in America. And we must see to it that this agency and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision so that we never cross over that abyss. There, that's the abyss from which there is no return. <laughs> yeah. And that's what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, the, like, do you think that we really have seen like, people like Frank Church or, or Eisenhower's warning about the, the military-industrial complex or JFK's warnings about uh, secret societies like, and sort of like, well, un unaccountable power operating in the shadows? Like, do, you think, do you think we've seen all of those come true and just sort of like barely noticed? Yeah, they're, um, you know, I, I almost want to work on a, another book and it would be my third because I'm already working on a second one and it doesn't really have to do with this. Uh, the, it's a fictional book, but uh, I almost want to call it like the secret society's paradox because it's impossible now uh, when you when you rationalize it. I, I, I've been really thinking about this and the secret societies have a serious problem because now they're out in the open what are they going to do? Because now they're creating, uh, well, they're creating people like yourself and I who are critical, who are saying, hey, you know, what's going on? We're starting to connect these dots. And there's a lot of people that are connecting these dots. Some are connecting them in wild ways, but they're still connecting the dots. And those are kind of the people they might want to be concerned about because these are the people that, you know, uh, they, they might go after the churches who might have nothing to do with them or the lodges. You know, it could be anything. They're creating this sort of violent uh, creation by their own design. And JFK had warned about this, that obviously things are, are being turned in the direction of the secret society, that, of course, there is a, a movement. And if I'm sure your viewers are watching, but I've got a black hand. If you remember back in World War I, it started because of the Black Hand. That's a, that's a major, that's a major uh, footnote about what the secret societies were doing at the time with Franz Ferdinand. Um, and the actions that they are carrying with them are having such implications that they're calculated and they're, they have a cult based on math. Uh, and math should be used to improve our lives, not further it into a little hole where we're all controlled little ants. This is really denying ourselves the spiritual and physical growth that we need as people, whether it's even if, if, if it's your average like writer like yourself or I or or a criminal, uh, you, you keep pushing that criminal down like an animal. They're going to attack. Uh, 
you know, like we were talking about the Unabomber, you know, of course he's stuck in where he is, but this, this society is creating super predators. So in other words, people are coming up with really ingenuitive, like ways to destroy people. Um, and that's kind of the whole sound uh, thing that the secret societies have been pushing for a long time. How do we get rid of our bad guys without doing the trigger pulling ourselves? It's, it's, it is evil. And I think that, you know, if we're going to progress as a civilization, we cannot uh, embrace what the secret societies are really offering right now. Uh, they're, they, they, they've lost their point. Um, and it's primitive, you know, it, it's literally primitive. It's like the Mayans, you know, and the Mayans wiped themselves out as far as we know, uh, based on evidence, but they could have went to outer space. They could have just mingled with the people. And now, you know, we're, we have ancestors of them. We don't know. And when secret societies keep this from us, they're hiding our history and their, our, our own crimes against humanity from ourselves. You know, it's a denial of information. It's a denial of pursuits. And uh, that warning that JFK had given, obviously, when he was assassinated, it, it's demonstrating how, how insane it really is. Um, even, even George HW Bush, uh, if, if you remember this correctly, was one of the first presidents to say we are creating a new world order. Mm. Um, and that was back in 89. We didn't have any ability to stop that. You know, it, I'm assuming you're in your thirties, like you would have been a child. And this man's already saying you're a slave. I'm a slave. All of these future generations, you know, have nothing. And, uh, it, it's just, it's unfortunate. Um, because the secret societies have all the power, the wealth and, and the influence. And what do, what do we have at the ground level uh, to have an organized effort for humanity to advance? Mm. Um, this, this is the problem. You know, uh, we can't all simultaneously agree. Let's do sacrifices or go to little meetings on Tuesday, uh, the second of the month. We, no one can really do this stuff. Um, so it, it, it's, the, the order is destroying its own, own purpose. And that's always been my opinion. Um, I, I make hip hop and rap. And just so people know, I, I've used that as lyrics before. Uh, <laughs> because it's like, I think that's one of the most important things we need to uh, remember about the warnings given uh, by Eisenhower, JFK. I mean, plenty of men over time have warned uh, about this, you know? Um, so... Uh, it's it's a, it's a stark reality, uh, but perhaps there's a way to change it. Perhaps there's a way that they'll they'll admit their faults and say we want to move forward. But you probably know as well as I do that's like a coin flip at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. 
It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence <laughs> in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're kind of sat on this precipice right now. I do want to caveat, actually, just before anyone's like, oh, my God, they've gone full conspiracy theory. Um, like when we're discussing, when we're talking about secret societies, we literally mean um, things like in the UK, we have the Bullingdon Club, which is uh, like a, an Oxford uh, group of guys. But they're like the, they all uh, it's like a private all male dining club um, mm -hmm. that were kind of, they were kind of parodied in a little way or, or at least referenced to in the film uh, The Riot Club. Um, yeah. that was oh, my, my five years ago. Um, in America, we're talking about things like Skull and Bones. Um, yeah. that, that, like, uh, there's several uh, former presidents who were part of Skull and Bones. Um, and then even beyond that, just like the, the sort of the, the A, the, the deep state that, that totally yeah. doesn't exist when Trump talks about it. But then, like, when you talk about it in terms of like preventing Trump being like completely crazy and doing stuff that's just off the wall, um, it, they're yeah. all very thankful that it's there. And it is, it's like a, a group of, sort of unelected um like career government employees essentially and then you've got like the military uh the, the high end of the military and that's all very sort of secretive and, and and classified and then we also mean things like um oh what's the name of the fucking group if i uh, if i could actually uh intervene real quick mm -hmm. um in my book i was talking about in the military we have gangs especially in america these are technically secret societies by definition. We don't know 
the MS-13. We don't know the Bloods. We don't know the Crips. We don't know the Latin Kings. Um, and we have intelligence officers all intermingled. This is dangerous. This, it, it's very dangerous. It doesn't matter if it's a secret society that was built on the, the Lodge, from the Lodge, uh, or from the Black Hand out in Europe, or, uh, or the ones that you would mention, Skull and Bones, and um, uh, the ones that you guys have in the UK. Mm. It, it's the concept that we really need to study and focus in on. Uh, they do exist. Mm. Yeah, there's and no then, denial. Uh, that there it is. The biggest, exist. the name has come back to me. The biggest one is obviously the Bilderberg Group, which everyone said yes. was totally fucking insane. Um, Bilderberg and, trilateral. And, yep. Yeah. Until until Alex Jones snuck in and took a video, and then <laughs> they were all like, "Oh, oh, maybe that is a, a thing." And the dra- they're burning the big like oil effigy. I'll put the video. Uh, I'll sort of like I'll, I'll overlay the video here for anyone who's not seen it. It's it's pretty wild, um, but like just. Just the idea that there's 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 people with a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of influence uh, making decisions uh, based on what they believe rather than um, you know an elected populace or a, a like a, an electorate <laughs> should should decide like they they they're the people that run run the world and and they're making decisions that are are not being made with our best interests at heart or with our consent essentially is 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 the big issue and and. Yeah, that's the, that's exactly what JFK and Eisenhower were both both warning about that this power would grow because of its money and power and influence, and that un, unchecked it would come to dominate the political landscape, with maybe without us even noticing. And like you can you can vary in your how much you believe that they're in control, and like you can say that yeah, okay, maybe they've just got some influence and they you know buy off some politicians through like super PACs or whatnot, or you could believe like the whole other end of the spectrum where you're like, yes, they can control every word of every speech made by every single establishment politician. It's like, mm, okay, maybe maybe that's a little paranoid, <laughs> but like the idea that, that that they exist is totally true. Like they do exist, they do have influence and power and money. And, and, and like, it's it, it, even just to say that makes you sound insane. <laughs> I know. Oh. I know. And it, it, it's, it's the fact that when you research certain topics, though, uh, you're like, oh, hey, you know, uh, the, the uh, Bilderberg group is involved. In, and this is taking it from a, a different perspective, but um, look at it from an economic standpoint, right? The Bilderberg group has a big hand in the economic trade of America. That's the backbone. Um, uh, you, you look at the Trilateral Commission. The Trilateral Commission also has a big hand in economics and foreign policy and trade. That is another economic backbone. Um, these things become tied so much that Wall Street, uh, DC, those groups, those two specific groups, um, and especially Harvard and Yale's little dirty secret. Uh, I, I, I call them, um, uh, you know, they're, they're one of those groups. Uh, I can't even think of what they're called right now, the, the university groups. But they're basically like uh, the proud boys of secret societies. Uh, if we're going to throw out like key words here, uh, they're, 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 they're controlling things as one spinal column for the American people. And the American people, instead of being... Uh, the voice as the spine, they have become the fingers. And we are sort of, we're being pushed to these, these, these optional limbs. Uh, instead of being the body, we have become the limbs. And this is, this is a problem. Um, the, the poison that we're sort of ingesting has come as a part of these economic trade policies your GMOs, uh, the, the things that you eat in your food or drink or take in medicine, this comes directly from these groups. So until we get better answers and demand them like for real, uh, these people are just going to keep trying to put down more things and more shadow groups will come into operation uh, if we don't face them. You know, it's, 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 it's like getting a cancer diagnosis. You've got you to gotta treat it. Otherwise, it's going to get worse. Um, and if anybody's listening that listens with sound logic, you understand if, if you get cancer, you can't just ignore it and hope it goes away. Uh, you, you are going to need treatment. You're going to need experts to help deal with it. In the same vein, we're going to need experts to really analyze this. And many have over the years, whether it's for history.com, 
um, which I reference a lot in, in my book, or people that just understand that, you know, the, the problem of society's growth starts to happen when a select group of people try to push for one particular thing or a narrative. And uh, whether it's our militaries, um, the, there's not a good excuse. Um, the technology, the use of it, the justification, it is, it's not humanitarian. And uh, that, that's, that's the problem with the elite groups. They, they don't seem to look at people anymore. As we look at them as representatives, they don't see themselves as representatives for us. They're seeing themselves as shepherds. And, uh, it, it, and it does put a bad taste in your mouth when you really think about it and you say, you know, um, we should have representatives in America. I know in, your, in Europe, it's a little bit different. You might, you might look at them as leaders, but in America, from my understanding, they're supposed to be representatives. It's, it's a, it is a representative democracy. It's, it's, it is a republic democracy, but it's a representative democracy nonetheless. And Donald Trump does not represent who I am. Uh, Obama did not represent who I was. George Bush did not represent, you know, this, this is an issue. You know, it is, it's, it's, it's distancing uh, our leaders from the American people. They don't know the struggle. They don't understand what struggles are. They have it kind of fed to them with the government plate. Uh, and that, it, it's troubling. It, it's absolutely troubling. And you know, somebody helped set that up. And it wasn't just a bunch of guys in robes that just, you know, it, 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 it's not even just that. It's it, it goes far deeper. And this power grab is destroying the purpose of representative democracy. Um, and I hope people understand before it's too late. But, you know, it. It, it, you know, with the first question that we had and we talked about, it's it's like when it where is too late? Is it too late? Are we hitting Orwellian status or are we hitting Bradbury status? I think we're hitting both. Uh, we're, we're we're seeing a dangerous combination of uh, cocaine and heroin right now, and <laughs> and uh, they're not working well together. Um, so. With secret societies, I think it's almost the same way. They met, they mesh, but they don't at the same time. They clash, but they don't at the same time. Um, and you're seeing this at, on a geopolitical level like it's never been seen before. Um, we're closer to a nuclear winter than we ever were before. Um, and the political climate is not eased by these secret societies at all. So there's a lot of questions sitting on their plates. Uh, there's a lot of issues sitting on their plates. And until they can really address it for the people, instead of putting us uh, at risk as targets, um, people won't understand. Uh, and this is where the whole thing with targeted individuals comes from. It's like you get singled out for having a differing opinion. Mm. But some people are just not happy that the world's being used as a battleground. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's a great way of putting it. The world is a battleground. I mean, my first book that's coming out in in February is called the the established Brexit, the establishment civil war, and it's basically just like essentially highlighting what you've pointed out there. And then like some people think that you know that there's some global group controlling every single decision that is made, and it's all just like part of their eight dimensional chess thing that they're trying to do. And like ultimately, it's a whole bunch of uh, uh, powerful people competing for the power themselves like with each other like like it's a there's like a constant internal battle between like different factions of 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 the ruling class essentially and and one of the one of the things that like is is amazing actually is really weird is the amount of discussion i have heard this year about how dangerous conspiracy theories are and like do, do you think that even just that word has become problematic because like like you say conspiracy theories and you go, okay, you know, you just think like people immediately go to like the tinfoil hat people. And, and, and when realistically, like all you're, all you're doing is like pointing out stuff that the government or, or groups have done that was illegal and unknown at the time. And, and we could, we've got plenty of historical evidence, uh, you know, uh, uh, such as the, the things you've referenced in your book, like, or like MK ultra, there's like the NSA program that that um, Edward Snowden unveiled. There was um, the, the the targeted individuals program that that the UN and Nils Meltzer are now investigating. Um, and the, the, like there, it's, it's all real phenomena 
and 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 like just but 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 anyone that tries to discuss it it just gets like labeled with this conspiracy theory brush and the general narrative tends to be like oh these people are all crazy they all think obama is a satanist who is sacrificing children in the oval office and you you know you you, i don't know what do you think that like it feels like a feels to me sometimes like a concerted like effort to like push any discussion of this out of the mainstream but then that could sound a little paranoid and it might just be a whole bunch of people like seeing conspiracy theories becoming more mainstream and deciding they want to talk about it and the only sensible like mainstream opinion of a conspiracy is they're oh what these crazy people like where do you what do you see going on there so i think uh I think the discrediting is it's a necessary factor to them. You know, for us, it makes things hard because you want people to understand that there's something affecting you and it's not coming from you. Um, and there's, if, if I may, I, I like using irony, but three degrees of, of, of truth. So you have the first degree where, where, uh, it doesn't start as a conspiracy, right? There's like Frank Church hearings. That's a big thing to me. After I researched that, I said, that's, 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 you can't ignore that. That's in history. So MK Ultra did exist because the Frank Church hearings and the testimony brought something back to life, right? That's the first degree where most people would research it, understand it, and they'd say, hey, there is proof that this program did exist. But you get the second degree. Now, that that second degree is where that uncanny valley starts to pop in. Again, referencing something we talked about earlier, uh, you almost don't want to believe it because it just doesn't seem like it makes sense. You And it would drive you insane trying to come up with the understanding or the reasoning or the explanation, like uh, how MKUltra could work in today's time using... Uh, 5G or wireless technologies, using satellite arrays, uh, microwaving us in some form. Um, and yet there's still ways to explain it, but there, it's almost like you're kind of loopy trying to explain it at the same time. So people might view you as, uh, and, 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 and there's a number of ways that can make you look crazy trying to explain it, but we have technology that proves there's microwave emitters. I mean, we have microwaves themselves. Uh, we, it's hard to say that there's a type of thing that could strike down a beam onto earth and set things on fire, but is it far-fetched? I don't think so. No. Um, and that's where you hit the third degree where the belief of something that could be totally bonkers, but has no real information regarding it. Uh, it's hard to just wildly believe something that you haven't definitively seen, right? That's where the conspiracy theory pops in because you're not really sure why, but something rubs you the wrong way and you want to cling to whatever you can to explain it, right? And maybe you don't find water for the topic at the time, but then there can be things where down the road, you come back to that second degree and then you come back to the first degree because guess what? Microwave technology exists. And uh, MKUltra, mind control, does exist. I don't need to do it uh, using like a laser gun from Star Trek, okay? I can do it by, uh, if I have enough money, uh, getting around you and and then like telling your friends like, uh, hey, you know, Josh, uh, uh, he did something bad, right? And suddenly I've been able to convince people around you, maybe in a subtle way, like, uh, uh, Josh, Josh steal soda, uh, from, from Rick or something, you know, this is where you would also have an issue because you wouldn't know how to explain it, but people treat you differently and you don't have a rational, uh, explanation for it. So you come to the analysis. Maybe people just don't like me anymore. That's where problems happen. And this is what our government has been doing secretly to a lot of people with intelligence uh, officers, with with, uh, all sorts of things. Um, I think that the DOD and the DOJ are absolutely guilty of of using technology against people 
for the reason of suppression, oppression, and you know other topics to keep certain information from getting out. Uh, and personally, if you ask me, I think uh, over in the UK, uh, the Ministry of Defense is 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 there. There's a lot of answers that need to come out, mm. uh, especially with the Ministry of Defense. Um, but again, uh, that's, that's, that's your cup of tea, uh, no pun intended, but, uh, it, it's kind of your cup of tea for, for another day for somebody to explain that. Um, but there's absolutely plenty where conspiracy theories themselves need to be addressed or at least acknowledged. And can we find a reasoning to their proof? Is there a, a burden of proof? Mm-hmm. Um, and with many topics, uh, especially nowadays, and the ones that we, we we talk about and estimate whether or not they're even real, there's a lot of they're, they're starting to hold water. Mm-hmm. Targeted individuals. There seems to be a program. There seems to be previous technology, previous sources. Uh, there's reasons that laws can be broken for them to even happen, uh, and it could be for the name of national security. That's the umbrella topic. Uh, and for people to actually have the theory, it shouldn't even be illegal. You know, if, if you want to believe that the Nazis cloned Obama and believe he sacrificed kids in rope, you're free to believe that. But coming up to the idea that like Nazis did that, you gotta, the burden of proof does fall on the person that believes in it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's good to be well-researched. I think it's good to read, of course, and, and really try to understand that even in the fictional works, they were alluding to things that shouldn't have existed and ended up existing. Mm. So in Fahrenheit 451, it was all about burning books, right? Yeah. We're in the era of burning information. Mm-hmm. So if information is not good to the defense industry, they're going to burn it like firefighters from the book. Um, and you're seeing that army people, uh, intelligence people, not, not in great number, but I'd love to see it in great number are starting to turn away from that and realizing they are the firefighters. They are the ones taking part in the program and they're demanding answers. So, uh, and veterans should be very mad. They, they should be very mad. The, the fact that I think there's homeless veterans in America is a crime. It, it, it's simply a crime, yeah, you know, that's... and it's a crime against humanity. Yeah, it's disgusting. Um, um, also, it just is. just just to sort of have a, a small aside here, like anyone that believes that, anyone that thinks that we're talking absolute nonsense, right, about um, about the, uh, like, targeted weapons. Okay, I'm sharing some stuff with you here. So Havana Syndrome was the, the, the case where a lot of people in Cuba started to experience weird, like, sickness. And uh, the, there's the BBC, Havana Syndrome likely caused by detected microwaves. Then we've got U.S. warned staff in China, beware of unusual sounds. Um, Mike Pompeo actually uh, testified in front of Congress to say that he believed that uh, these uh, that there was like a sound weapon or a microwave weapon being used against a U.S. diplomat. Then we've got a thing about Taiwan's eerie sonic weapon, which is like a big sound wall thing. Uh, like the, the 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 list goes on. It's it's not we're 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 not not talking rubbish here basically is is my um is my point and and like anyone that again thinks that this is insane or if youtube decide they want to ban ban us they're very big on that they love to do that but we haven't mentioned covid so they shouldn't ban us um, <laughs> that's what I like i sometimes i feel like i'm on a podcast did you ever see faulty towers it was a uh, it's uh it's with john cleese it was from from monty python he had like a series about about running a hotel and there was an episode uh where where this old german guy comes and he says don't mention the war it's like don't mention the covid i did once but i think i got away with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh you know i uh actually speaking of uh, conspiracies yeah, talking about covid and its source is the conspiracy <laughs> um and we're really up in the air about where it came from still and we're saying that no no came- no no james it came from a bat it did not come from the level four biological warfare lab that was in wuhan that was sanctioned last year for uh, safety violations and then has been destroyed it definitely definitely didn't come from there uh, it was totally just natural, and and the, any questions about it are are ridiculous. Right, right, right. 
<laughs> yes, but that's actually what we were talking about in motion. Like it's right there, uh, uh, covering up a disaster from <laughs> its roots. Just trying to figure out the information and cover it. Like uh, the doctor who found it is also dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, no that way. I didn't stuff, know that. that that type. Yeah, the, uh, the the I think the doctor who researched it or found it is you know was dead from it. So I mean, it, or it's you you have no idea. You know, like it, there's not really, and there's not even a definitive way to know. Um, and that 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 information scrutiny can be picked up by anybody. That's actually part of the problem. Anybody can pick up the information and try to drive it their own way. And uh, it will. When, when you commandeer the thought control that the masses try to decide what that means, uh, the conspiracy theory thing is taken on such a huge level that they're going past the third degree and into like the fifth degree where it doesn't even exist. Like where, where, where they could say that, it, no, it never came from a bat in the first place. It came from a rabid human being out in Arkansas. Uh, you know, they'll come up with these wild conclusions to these wild theories where you're like, hold on a second. We got to come back to rational thinking. So at the end of the day, it's kind of like trying to figure out coronavirus and, and, and even its symptoms. We're, what are the symptoms? We, we don't even know. I've heard everything from trouble breathing to not trouble breathing to feeling sick to not. I, I, you know, this yeah, is the same problem with topics. It's the same problem with the targeted individual thing. It's the same. It's the same thing trying to come to an, uh, a conclusive analysis or conclusive uh, uh, anything regarding the topic seems to be met with, with as much disinformation as possible. And trying to find the truth out of it is becoming like finding a needle out of a haystack. Mm. Um, so you, you can thank the elite powers for making it really hard to find yeah. a lot of these answers. But yeah. I, I assure you, in my book, I came to a, a pretty sound conclusion about the things that I found. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, people will have to read it to find out. We don't want to give away the ending. Yeah. Um, but also to note, like if, if anyone's sitting there thinking, you know, the gov governments would never try and silence someone just for speaking the truth. It's just like Julian Assange. Julian fucking Julian Assange. Assange. Like, like He's the, still... Yeah, there is. I, I, there's rumors that Trump's going to pardon him. And I was just like, oh, my God, like this, like what a way to go out. Like liberals hit you for four years, like you're the worst man on the planet. And then you like pardon Julian Assange. You would just be like, what a way to go mm -hmm. out, man. Yeah. <laughs> like that would, mean, that, it, that would seriously improve my opinion of him. Um, like it, it, <laughs> he it would. would, but I, we're, we're going to find out. And I hate being a pessimist, but the. He had distanced himself from WikiLeaks a while ago, and he and I found that to be troubling. I said, hey, that's a mistake. Donald Trump should say that information should be publicly shared. He didn't obviously he can't really put it that eloquently. But like the, the thing is, is that that was a, that was a big thing. Just the fact that we were hearing about a, a WikiLeaks and cables being uncovered. This was starting to show us that there was evidence. And when he distanced himself, it, it was uh, it was putting people like Julian Assange, who was doing the right thing. He was he was bringing the truth to light to help improve the entire world. And we in America, some people see him as a treasonous man, and some see him as a hero. So now he's being martyred, and I have the fear that Trump would extradite him, and if he's going in the direction of where it is right now, um, he's ordering executions. That's stark, and I can't imagine that Julian Assange deserves that. I don't think he deserves it, and in fact, we shouldn't be treating him like he's Galileo Galilee and uh, imprisoning, him, imprisoning him in his own abode or, or throwing him in jail. For literally just trying to find words and the truth that, that that's not a yeah. crime. No, no. I mean, like it, the man, just, just, just to be clear here, like WikiLeaks have never had to retract anything, like anything. They, they never right. ever printed anything false. Like that is, that is a fucking good record for any publisher and, and any, any, in any like, like venue or, or forum or, or, or topic, like just to, to have never printed anything false ever. 
Like you've only printed yeah. the truth. And I think Trump and, might, and, well, Trump might have tried what? to distance himself due to the, the Russia sort of allegations that, that WikiLeaks got a bunch of Hillary's emails from Russia. But they have consistently denied that. Um, and I, I guess I don't really know what to make of that. They might not be entirely sure as to where the information came from. But I feel like that's why Trump Trump distanced himself. But like there is like legit talk that he's gonna pardon him on the way all, as like a big fuck you to all like the to the basically the entire political establishment who want him locked up for life. I would get a big thumbs up for that. If that happened, I would give him a huge thumbs up. I would be like, okay, all right, I approve of that one. Uh, that 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 would be a good move. I I'm I I have fear that maybe there is something in the cables that had uh, Trump a little bit nervous, but I don't know. Um, I'm Again, I, I can't definitively prove that. And unfortunately with WikiLeaks, I haven't, I, I, I can't quite do the research on the cables. Like maybe I should really look deeper into it. Um, actually, I didn't, I didn't play anybody watching or listening to really uh, try to understand what WikiLeaks has been showing us. It, and it does have to be with trade out of the cables you might, we wouldn't know the connections we do if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. We wouldn't know about some of those connections on the higher level on uh, the economic status right now if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. Donald Trump, if he was guilty, would have showed up in those cables. He didn't. And uh, for some people, yes, especially liberal people, they, they, they don't want to accept that he isn't involved. But it is possible that somebody external is not involved in trying to to bring that to light because there are the political opponents and they are guilty of doing a lot of these things should be exposed for it and as they should um it, it is a three-way struggle here in america because you have your average citizen you have the outsider and then of course you have the political insiders who have been nancy pelosi's and your susan collins and your 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 you know your your John McCain's they have been literally in office since the dinosaur era and they they have a very firm grip on the way that old world works here so uh, it'd be interesting to see like a conservative progressive movement in America of some type that's that's trying to see the truth they're trying to understand the truth they want to see it they want to fix the economic struggles and the debt and the disparity they want to get the vets off the streets they want to do the right thing you know, because we can't keep doing it. We just yeah. can't. And in an American, in a, a country that touts freedom, we should be able to embrace it without putting people in prison. It mm -hmm. is totally against the grain. And with Julian Assange, he is a victim. It, it, it is simply he is one of many targeted individuals, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Um, I don't see what he did as treasonous. I, I just don't see it. I see maybe he could do a, a year or two in jail, but I don't see that he really deserves it <laughs> i just can't see it i mean he's been locked uh, up it is he's, a little... he's been locked up for years already like he's he's been punished it's enough been in my mind yeah like and like the guy the guy talking like to bring this back to the microwaves and the sound weapons like he has self-reported um like hearing things in his head like a which is a known side effect of uh, of some of the, the sort of signed and microwave weapons that uh, have been used on U.S. diplomats in China. Like he was re he's reporting the same symptoms as they were with like music and noise being heard inside his head, which is weird. Like, so either he's just like lost his mind from isolation or he's being targeted like with weird fucking microwave weapons. And either, either answer is fucking disturbing because as we mentioned, the man's only printing the truth. But on what you said about the, the progressive conservative movement, um, would be interesting. Like you know what happened? Did you did you hear about Unity Twenty Twenty? Can't say I have. Okay, so it was it was uh, basically a proposal from this guy um, Brett Weinstein, who is uh, an evolutionary biologist um, yep. and was a professor at Evergreen State University until he got uh, hounded out for um, suggesting that asking white people not to come to campus on a day was maybe slightly racist. And um, then he got like a huge, huge settlement from the university, which was basically them saying, no, you were right, Brett. But um, anyway, he he's like, the, he's a super, super, super left wing guy, which is the craziest thing about it. And like he's he. Uh, yeah, just just uh, I don't even understand how they came to the conclusion that he was was racist. It's, it's insane. But. Anyway, he set up this, uh, he put forward this idea this year that you should take someone from the center left and someone from the center right, and you run them as 
president and vice presidential candidates with the agreement that after four years, they're going to switch and say that, say they get elected again. Sweet. Then the next, after four more years, then they'll switch. And the, the idea was basically that he wanted to put competent patriots in office. Like that was his, that was his, st- his statement. And I can't remember who he suggested from the center, right, but it was like a former military vet um, or commander. And on from the left, center left, he wanted Andrew Yang. Um, and basically they, they were just saying, look, we want to take the center ground and just, just like with reasonable, competent patriots who will fight for like the rights of the normal people. And they got banned from Twitter. Mm-hmm. Like they just got banned from Twitter. And at that point, they kind of get, they kind of accepted that it wasn't going to happen this year. I would watch for tw- Unity 2024. But I, like, right now, we're watching the clamp down on, on free speech from all the social media companies, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. They've all decided to become the arbiters of, of truth and fact. Uh, and that that is super, super dystopian. Like mm-hmm. I have been this, 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 I can tell you for a fact, I did an interview with this guy, Jeffrey Tucker, um, who is the, 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 the editor at the American Institute for, for free enterprise. I think it's the end of free enterprise anyway. And he, we were talking about, about, uh, lockdowns and masks and COVID and like the evidentiary basis for a lot of the, the measures and well, the lack of in, in some cases. And f- since then, since posting that on Facebook, I have been like locked out of my account three times for suspicious activity. No, like no, no indication as to what that suspicious activity is. No, like explanation. They just locked me out. And that's the only thing I can think of. Uh, and so I feel like, I feel like we're witnessing this, this, the start of this, or it's not, maybe not even the start. It could be the very end of, of this final clamp down. But like, like, are you concerned for the future? <laughs> I mean, it is concerning because you can't function, you know, if your life is controlled to such a point where uh, you can't get into your own internet accounts, you know, everything's electronic, so they can shut you off at any second. So let's say you have money and, and let's say 10 years down the road, okay, this here's a prediction and I hate making predictions, but I know it's probably going to happen. Everything's electronic, right? And in Fahrenheit 451, you could access your money at any time. But I think in, it was possible for them to cut your money off. So in other words, the, the government that be in Fahrenheit 451 essentially could cut you off from your money if you refuse to go to your job. And if that were the, if that were the case, that's slavery. You know, if we are cut off from our, our, our I suppose, our lifeblood, because you know, all developed worlds use money. Um, This means that your progression in life can be halted at literally the, uh, sorry, at the, uh, at the the push of a button. And uh, I think that this is going to be kind of an issue down the road uh, in a number of ways, but in such a way that you can't even move forward. So where we're going is not good. If we think it's dystopic now, we haven't even seen what's going to happen. It's the idea that thought control, money control, what we say, uh, what we say, uh, what we do, will all be recorded, and it will all affect every little action mm. that we have down the road. If you're a strong believer in string theory and butterfly effect, I- forget the fact that men might run up to you with pitchforks and torches because they heard something that uh, it was gossip. The government could just say, oh, you were doing good and left your job. Well, that affected our economy. We're going to press the button and make you a super criminal. Mm. Just like that. And suddenly you're, you're a predator. You're an enemy of the people. You've done this. You've done that. You haven't done it, but you've done it. So, um, and this, this, this is where things are going. To, it's going to spiral. Mm. It, 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 if, if we don't do something now, this ability to do this is controlled by our military and intelligence. We have the chance to stop. We have a really narrow, narrow window of time. But if you're able to really organize the efforts, especially around the world, it's possible to stop. But with, with, with India and China's regulations of technology and where they're going, they've already got child labor. 
it's only a matter of time till America starts going backwards and mm. starts employing that same tactic with mm. who knows what. It could be a takeover of our own government by our own government. Yeah. First thoughts they've already done. But no, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, <laughs> the, the the documents that came out this week. Let me let me just get this up and pull this up for people who, who haven't heard. Um, is the amount um, the amount of people who uh, the amount of there's like like thousands of uh, Chinese agents. Here it is, Business Insider. Data leak shows over two million Communist Party members were are have infiltrated like different um, different companies and organizations. So what's that? Data leak shows that over 2 million Chinese Communist Party members were secretly embedded in organizations around the world, including India. But that includes uh, like the UK. They Among the com- companies mentioned are manufacturers such as Boeing, Volkswagen, pharmaceuticals like Pfizer and AstraZeneca, banks like ANZ and HSBC, Around 600 people at HSBC. It's just, you know, anyone that thinks that the that, that there's not people attempting to influence or infiltrate governments, um, like or intelligence services or different companies, is you're being fucking naive, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to put it very bluntly, um, like the China has long been accused of like launching like really severe cyber attacks on the West. They are constantly stealing intellectual property. They, um, and they are committing genocide as, as I, as I discussed with on, on, on the podcast, like a few weeks ago with Dr. Erkin Siddick, that they are, they are literally authoritarian, like nightmares. They, they are literally the worst people that we could possibly imagine. And yet the idea that they might be trying to fuck with their biggest rival or their biggest rivals in Europe and America is just obvious in a way. (laughs) And yeah, Yeah. I I, I don't know. I don't know where people get off on pretending like you're insane to suggest that our, our biggest strategic and military rival might be trying to, you know, screw with us. Like, I, I don't think, I think we're probably in some some form of cold war with China ultimately right now. And it seems like they might be winning. <laughs> it seems it, but let me offer some reassurance to, to your viewers and, and, and listeners. And uh, I have a firm belief that China also has a huge problem. They're like many Asian countries, they're kind of xenophobic. So in other words, they're not going to willingly invite you into their country. You know, like they don't really want you to be a part of the Chinese government. They don't want you to really be, you know, they want you to visit China, but they don't want you to be in the government. Now, in America, if you're Chinese, if you're Indian, if you're African, whatever, you could be English. You're allowed to be a representative. So that's always been kind of the draw of America. And that's kind of the advantage at the same time. We are the economic superpower regardless. The way that things got to where they were was because of America in the first place. But now we've kind of got the problem and China's trying to take the ball. You know, it's like basketball and they're trying to steal the ball and make all the hoops. But you can't just have the same players on the same team. You got to have the best of what every country offers. And we are that ultimately like at the end of the day even though you know the uk america india a lot of people in europe and asia are all guilty we have a lot at our disposal that allowed for the inclusion of many people of many walks of life and that ultimately is what unites us it's not conquest if a country was about conquest they wouldn't be using subterfuge it would be simply predominantly military power destroying the world. And Russia has a lot of nukes, China has a lot of nukes, but what is really the value of them if they're not built well? You see what I mean? They're not built with foresight. They're not built with forethought. And ultimately, although they can use all, all the thought control they want, it's propaganda and it's not a sound weapon. So China, Russia, India, uh, you you could go through the list of of all the biggest countries here. They all kind of have the same problem. 
other than America and the UK. They only allow what's going on in their country. They don't allow for involved politics from the people themselves. They just simply say, this is what we're about. We're going to keep running the empire the way we do. And we're going to use stolen technology to try to win the world. It, it sounds like something out of a cartoon. And it, it's like when you when they approach with that logic, just remember, it sounds like a cartoon. It's not done with sound advice. It's not down, done with, 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 with battle commanders who know what they're doing. They're entering a new age of war and they're definitely losing because they're being caught guilty. So if we turn our intelligence efforts, instead of messing with our own people to fighting this and ending it, China and Russia will lose its grip on the people of slavery. They will lose their slave labor. And that's kind of what they need in order to continue economic growth. If they continue to do what they do now, there's no telling where it stops. So like I said, there's a lot of three-way battles going on. And it's, uh, I just wish that we would turn our military efforts off from the people and like really start directing our attention towards like focusing on the humanitarian effort. If we lead by example, the people of those countries will see hey, the UK, America, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, they're all doing things right. Let's go there. Let's leave this place. This place is horrible. It's just, it, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's amazing that uh, Russia has advanced as far as it did from the Soviet era because it doesn't seem like they move forward. And China seems to be trying to go back into the feudal era with cell phones. Um, it, it, it's kind of a joke. And um I think that we it won't be a joke if we don't take the necessary steps to really tell the people, hey, you know, you guys have to beware. You have to be careful. We need to, like, do something here. It's the same thing in America. If we keep allowing our politicians to go the direction it is, who knows what it'll turn into, you know. Um, and the, 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 the uh, plutocrats can only get as far as that money is worth. And once that money is worthless... They don't have power of the people anymore, and they don't have power. So it's a symbiotic relationship, as far as I'm concerned. But we might as well make the best of it while we can and try to, like, fix these issues before they compound into something far worse. Um, it, it's, it's, it is a, it's a damning problem right now. And uh, I hope the world can really get its head out of its ass. You know, uh, we, we just want to live our lives, you know, I'm sure as well as you do, I just want to write, I want to drink coffee. I don't want to worry about a nuclear apocalypse or a hacker, you know, I, and I, all my laptops do not go online. None of them go online because I don't want my intellectual property stolen. So it's like I'm living in 1993, man. It really is. I, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm running out of power on my phone, but I figure I give people like background just real quick. I've been homeless for two years now and uh, my economic troubles have been the way that it has been, but I still function. But in America, it becomes harder and harder and harder every day. You know what I mean? So the thing that keeps me going is working, writing, and, you know, trying to keep my head above the water. But at the same time, I still have plenty of time to research that. Yeah, there's a lot going on in our world that we need to fix. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's it, it's good that we have this kind of talk. Somebody in the world needs to really, like, embrace the idea that there are things going on. And, like, if they're ignored, who knows what could happen? Even this conversation could save history. Even the smallest one, even if it's you telling a kid to stop smoking cigarettes, your 10 years old kid, stop doing that. You know, that's a that's an important thing that can have lasting effects for years to come, as small as it might may be. I'm, and I'm only saying that because I actually had to say that to a kid like this summer. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Right. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm running out of battery on my phone, but uh, that's all right. This no, has that's been a fun conversation. Yeah, man, I was going to say, that feels like a real nice positive um, point on which to leave things. Um, please, everybody, go check out James's book. It's I will put the link in the description below. And uh, yeah, man, it was, a, it was an absolute pleasure. Thanks, thanks very much for taking the time. No problem. And uh, if uh, people want to help me out directly, because I'm trying to get myself into a proper place and get heat in my car for the main winter, I do have a PayPal. I, if, if it's okay, can I shamelessly plug that? Go for it. 
Awesome. It's easy to remember. Ready? PayPal.me slash the homeless king. <laughs> I will... I'm the king of the homeless. Yeah. Uh, I will... my, YouTube, my old YouTube name was uh, the homeless king James for the Bible. Uh, it's, it is currently, uh, it's currently James D the writer of Fahrenheit for, uh, 1984. Mm -hmm. So, uh, please check that book out. Um, I don't get very much from the Amazon sales because Amazon needs more of my money than I do, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but it's good to have a place where we can put our books. Um, so it's fantastic and easy to read and it makes for a great Christmas present. I'll tell you that, especially for people that really need to open their eyes a little bit more. Hmm. <laughs> Hopefully we get some people red pilled from reading it, but yeah, man, thanks. It was a, uh, it was a pleasure. Very good. Hey, I appreciate this, Josh. Thank you so much, my friend. No problem. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget my book, Brexit, the establishment civil war is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. Until next time, thanks so much for listening.